about to have my idea. It'd be kind of, you know, an understatement. Uh, I'm afraid if I talk too damn long, I'm going to choke up. But we've got a guy that we love a lot. Ready? Here it is for you. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Welcome to episode 22. I'm gonna hop in and talk about Freddie Steinmark. Freddie Steinmark. I don't know how many of us know his name. Um, I know I definitely didn't until um, I kind of started to uncover some things. But um, think Rudy, and this is gonna sound maybe really ugly, but think of Rudy, the football player in Notre Dame. The only difference is Freddie Steinmark actually played. Um, hate to be ugly and. It's not nice. I shouldn't say that, but he just played. Okay. Rudy didn't play much. He played once. It was a movie and Freddie Steinmark played. Um, they were both the same though. They were both underdogs and um, I don't necessarily know what it is, but we all love underdogs, sports related or not sports related. Um, we all love Kurt Warner, right? Kurt Warner uh, was bagging groceries, later went on to win a Super Bowl. We love it. We love it. Uh, Tom Brady. We all love Tom Brady at the Combine, the video of him at the Combine. We love it. We love when he first won a Super Bowl because he was an underdog. Um, it became not cool anymore when he started just con- just continued to win. Um, that wasn't fun anymore. But even you know World War II stories, a lot of times war stories, we love them. We love the underdogs. Um, going back all the way to the Revolutionary War, I think it's the underdog we just, we just love. And that's the story of Freddie Steinmark. So Freddie Steinmark was um, an underdog and really counted out his entire life Um, it wasn't just one um, triumph that he had he was um, in the 1960s 1970s Um, there's a great book by Jim Dent who wrote the Junction Boys wrote 12 Mighty Orphans and he's a great especially historical sports nonfiction author it's fantastic so I'd recommend picking that up but so anyways Freddie was he grew up in a small town of Wheat Ridge Colorado Uh, he was a great kid great athlete he was very very small for his for his size um but freddie was the type of kid think when you were in when you were playing sports and you were a kid and the coach would say you know hey we gotta just run around the track once we'll get warmed up or we're gonna get going you know freddie was the kid who was 20 30 yards ahead of the guy in second place like we're treating this we're treating this 400 meter warm up as as a race and everything he did he did that way. Like he was just the first in all the drills, the first in everything. And I think, you know, you, you kind of hated him. You kind of got frustrated by that, but deep down you loved him because you knew he had your back and you know, no matter what, he wasn't going to loaf. And he was a Johnny hustle to go off la- last episode. He was a Johnny hustle. He just hustled and he did the right things. He may not have been the most talented, but he had by far the biggest work ethic. There was a pledge that they had during PB football of his PB football team. It read, I will play the game hard and clean and never be a quitter what matters most is courage it's not a disgrace to be beaten the greatest disgrace is to quit and turn yellow in peewee football freddie once played an entire quarter with a broken arm okay so this is peewee football in high school he once played a leg he once played a leg he once played three quarters of a game in high school with a broken leg he just pushed through it's like i just he just kept going um his pain tolerance was very low and he just pushed through Faith was everything to him. So he was a, I mean, he's Catholic, um, but he was, he was deeply re- religious and um, his relationship with Christ was, it was a huge foundation for everything that he did. And it was very, that was very evident as well. In high school, he won the Golden Helmet Award and that was given to the best scholar and athlete in the state of Colorado. He won Athlete of the Year in Colorado. Um, but he wasn't being recruited, so he played safety and he played running back. I think he was the third leading running back in the state, despite being on the team with a guy named Bobby Mitchell. Bobby Mitchell was a bruiser. He was a big, tall running back. Um, think of like a thunder and lightning running back. So he was running between the tackles. He was um, just big, dominant. And Freddie was smaller. He's about five foot nine, and he was your speed back. He would return kicks and punts often for touchdowns, but he was small. People would joke that he actually looked like a jockey. And so he wasn't getting recruited. Bobby Mitchell was getting recruited for basically every big big school. Um, and he had similar numbers to Bobby, but he wasn't being recruited. And that became, I think, frustrating. That was one of the accounts of the underdog, but that's where Freddie just moved on to the next thing. And, and there was a legendary coach, Daryl Royal, 
of the University of Texas. They were going hard after Bobby Mitchell. And every time they put the tape on a Bobby Mitchell, there was one player who stood out. And it wasn't Bobby Mitchell. It was Freddie Steinmark. At safety, at running back, he, was, he would just pop on the tape. And they lined up for him, for Freddie to go to get a chance to meet Daryl Royal with Bobby. Now, I believe personally that this was sort of a package deal that Texas was, was thinking. Probably at the time, they're thinking, hey, we want Bobby Mitchell, but I think we might have to try to get this kid, Freddie Steinmark, as well to get him to go. You still see this in college recruiting now. They'll get teammates all the time, but they're really going after one player. And so Daryl offered him a, coach, a chance to play at Texas. He could see his character. He could see the guy who was just emotionally incredibly strong. They couldn't get over how hard he could hit on the tape. And then during, so he played freshman year. He played the freshman team at Texas. Freddie played. He was a leader of the freshman team at Texas. And what's interesting is Bobby didn't play. Bobby was getting benched. Bobby Mitchell wasn't playing. He was getting very frustrated. So Freddie kind of helped push him through that. But then the start of the sophomore year, coaches thought they had gone down, lost their mind because they were ready to start Freddie Steinmark at safety for the University of Texas at basically 155 pounds. And the Dallas Herald wrote an interesting piece, kind of the beginning of sophomore year and during the sophomore year. They wrote, Freddie is one of the most special players in college football. He stands at five foot nine, less than 160 pounds, but he will crack you like he weighs 230. He is the heart and soul of the Texas secondary. And you have to keep in mind another thing too is so this is the 1960s, right? People are experimenting, there's LSD, there's drugs, alcohol, sex, partying, a lot of experimentation has taken place in the 1960s. And Freddie was never seen at parties. He was never seen getting drunk. He was never seen doing the wrong thing. He was never swearing. Um, he always stuck to his principles. And the principles, he said, were the big four. The big four was faith, football, chemical engineering, and Linda Wheeler. Linda Wheeler was his longtime girlfriend since the eighth grade in the state of Colorado. Linda Wheeler ended up following him to the University of Texas. They were madly in love. And that was his longtime girlfriend. And so he never bent against those, the big four, as he called it, the big four principles that he had. Bobby Mitchell was his roommate in college, and he'd often see Freddie Steinmark kneeling beside his bed every night reciting prayers. Um, and that became a huge piece because Bobby Mitchell ended up losing his brother. Um, his brother was killed in Vietnam during the, their junior year. And Freddie Steinmark was monumental in helping Bobby get through that and the anger that was, that was within him. The real unfortunate news became in the start of Freddie's junior year. So the summer leading up, Freddie had started experiencing some, some leg pain uh, right at the knee. And he thought it was just something he did during conditioning, thought he tweaked it. And so he kept pushing through, but unfortunately he couldn't get, he couldn't hide the limp. He was doing his best to hide the limp, but he just couldn't do it. It was even, he even said, um, this pain in my leg has been bugging me for six weeks, but there's no reason to sit me. I just think I need to get into the whirlpool. And so Frank Medina, Frank Medina, I don't know how you say his name, but he was the trainer at University of Texas at the time. And they would have a phrase that if you have pain above the waist, take an aspirin. If you have pain below the waist, get in the whirlpool. And Freddie, uh, Freddie was also told by the trainer too, just be careful. You don't want the coaches to see you in the tub too long because then they'll start to wonder what's going on. And so the time period you got to keep in mind is injuries are often seen, were often seen as a direct reflection of your character and a direct reflection of your work ethic. If you were hurt, even if it was something legit, broken leg or whatever, it was often seen as a, your, your character, or your work ethic, if you're not going to push through. Okay. And I think now we've maybe swung to the opposite end of the pendulum um, where even, you know, if I cut my fingernails too short, it's it hurts, man. It hurts my whole hand, and I can't even point to which fingernail it is, but it hurts. And even, even I had to laugh is even moving this table. I was moving this table just an hour ago or so, and I banged up my hand real good. Boy, I thought about, I thought about resting a week myself, and maybe just doing this podcast later on. I don't think I could push through, but anyways, I'm day to day, and I'm and I push through. But I think the pendulum. My point is, my the pendulum. I think is swung the opposite way now, where. You know, now turf toe will knock a dude out for six weeks. Whereas, you know, in the 1960s, you just didn't have a toe when you were playing. And that's okay. You just, you played without a toe. 
And, and so I don't know what the balance is, but I know that it's somewhere in between those two. But we're still, you know, on the, on the other side of the 1960s where pain and injuries are not treated probably where it should be. Um, the trainer also told Freddie to just go ahead. Yeah, I got an idea. After practice, Freddie, just run more. Just try to run it out. Maybe you'll run that pain right away. Well, this is going to shock you guys, but that that didn't work, despite the uh, prescribed post-game, post-practice running that they gave Teddy. That didn't work. You see, deep down, Freddie had a tumor in his leg that was growing. They just didn't know it at the time, and they didn't run x-rays. They didn't run x-rays during the season. As Freddie was slowly losing his step, they thought maybe it was just a Charlie horse, but they didn't know. They ultimately didn't know. They thought maybe it's just a Charlie horse, but the extra running didn't help. And what's very telling is Freddie didn't hold any re-anger or resentment during this time. A little later on, when the diagnosis did come out, he didn't hold any anger or resentment, it, it appears, for the training staff or the coaching staff that didn't get an x-ray sooner. Um, he was on to the next thing. He didn't get hung up on the old thing. But it all came to a head after nine games. Um, they are playing the University of Arkansas. Texas was undefeated at the time. Arkansas was undefeated at the time. The winner would go on to basically play in the Cotton Bowl for the national championship. And it was late in the game, and Freddie was burnt on a go route. And he had no choice but to wrap the receiver up and get called for the obvious pass interference. Coach Royal and the coaching staff immediately pulled Freddie out. They'd been not wanting to do it just because he was such a leader of the team, but he was starting to really hurt the team. What's crazy is that pass interference that they called ended up saving the game essentially and winning it for the University of Texas. That game, that touchdown wasn't, was taken away. Um, and it, the game wasn't put away and Texas came back and they came back and won. And so that play actually ended up saving, saving the game for Texas. And they went on to go play Notre Dame. After that Arkansas game, the coaching staff immediately got an x-ray for Freddie because they knew a couple of things. They knew he'd have plenty of time to rest before the Notre Dame game and they get him back. And let's just go to get an x-ray now. They got an x-ray and they found the tumor. They're 99% sure it's osteogenic sarcoma, which is a cancer that often hits young adults and children. Um, the doctors told Coach Royal in the hospital there's a chance of what it was, the cancer, and they said even basically, even despite the amputation, there's a really good chance this is going to come back. Coach Royal, 40 years later, said he still regrets to the day that he didn't tell Freddie the truth. Freddie knew the doctors weren't telling him something, he pushed Coach Royal on it, and Coach Royal didn't tell him, and he still regretted it 40 years later. Freddie said, right now I'd settle for losing a leg if it would just save my life. Doctors were also amazed they couldn't figure out how his leg just hadn't snapped. The cancer was just eating away the bone. They couldn't figure out how he was even able to play, walk, anything, let alone through the nine games he pushed through. The cancer was eating away his bone. Um, the players would sit in the parking lot, ready to go visit Freddie in the hospital after the Arkansas game. And they were often just, you know, I can picture them looking in the mirror, trying to hype themselves up for what kind of pep talk, what kind of motivational speech they're going to have to give Freddie to lift him up. When they walked to the hospital room, they hear laughter. It was because Freddie was telling jokes to the team, and Freddie was the one giving motivational speeches to the team and perhaps for their Notre Dame game. He was on to the next thing. Freddie was offered a coaching job by Coach Royal in the hospital to coach the freshmen. He wanted him to lead the freshmen. In the hospital room, Freddie said, this is the greatest offer of my life I've ever heard in my life. I can't wait to start coaching. There was just never any sorrow, and it was just he was on to the next thing. Post-amputation, Freddie weighed 128 pounds but he's focused on the next thing. He said, I know my surgery was only five days ago, but I want to start planning for the Cotton Bowl. I want to walk out onto the field on my own and stand on the sideline for the whole game. I want to be with my teammates. And that game was just 15 days away. Again, how would it, I don't know how I would react, but it wouldn't be this if I woke up in the hospital room with my leg gone at the hip. It wouldn't be that. I'd probably be self-pity and sorrow. I would not be onto the next thing. People that have amputations are often known to go into a deep depression and just a bunch of psychological trauma, but you just don't see that here. And Freddie ended up making it onto the sidelines of the Notre Dame, Notre Dame game. He got a standing ovation when he came out uh, before the team, crutching himself out onto the game. And the, and the footage is just incredible. 20 days after surgery, he was seen in the Cotton Bowl on the sidelines standing with his teammates. 
Texas ended up winning that. James Street, the quarterback, ended up orchestrating a historic comeback against Notre Dame. And there's even a moment where you can see Coach Coach Royal and Freddie, I'm sorry, uh, James Street talking uh, with the scoreboard in the background um, as they were orchestrating that final game-winning drive. Texas ended up beating Notre Dame. It was a classic comeback. And by the time the team got back in the locker rooms and the door was shut, the media was out, the team knew they won that game for Freddie. And there's a great video that we'll cut to of, of Coach Royal, too, giving Freddie the game ball. It'd be kind of, you know, an understatement. Uh, I'm afraid if I talk too damn long, I'm going to choke up. But we've got a guy that we love a lot. And I think that's just... Ready? Here it is for you. I mean, it's just incredible. The guy came back and came back on the sidelines 20 days later without his leg. He was just playing in a game, the last game he just played in. Um, but he was on to the next thing, and the next thing was he wanted to walk across the stage to get his letter, letter jacket. Coach Royal said it was the most emotional time of his life to see Freddie pushing across the stage, walking across the stage with a prosthesis he had for 10 days to get his letter jacket. Doctors told him not to do it, but he did it, and he walked across the stage unassisted after losing his leg for just a month before. But he's on to the next thing. He started taking up golf. In nine holes, he shot a 53. He got it down to a 46, they said, by the end of the summer. Again, this is one leg. I can't golf that on four legs if I had them. I, I'm not that that would help anyways, but I guess my point is, is I just couldn't. I couldn't imagine, let alone the guy had one leg. Oh, and by the way, in the hospital bed, he said he would, that's okay, I think I might just be a one-legged punter. I think he meant it as a joke, but also he meant it seriously. He was on to the next thing. He took up water skiing after golf. Um, again, I just know that's that just speaks to his character. It's not it's not the way I would probably handle things. Unfortunately, towards the end of his life, this is about a year after the Notre Dame game, he was admitted back to the hospital. They found two spots on his lung. Um, the osteosarcoma had come back, and it was a very aggressive form of cancer. In fact, at one moment. They gave him just hours to live. Um, but he ended up living for 48 more days at that point. Towards the end of this battle, he told his teammate who came to visit him, he said, I don't care if I live to be 30 or 100. I would never have given up that season with the national championship. That was the greatest season of my life. And what's interesting is, personally and statistically, that was by far the worst season Freddie had ever had. He wasn't, he was losing the speed. His interceptions had gone way down. I mean, he ended up getting obviously pulled from the Arkansas game. But he said it was the best season of his life. And it just shows you he wasn't about him at all. It was about the team. Freddie proposed to Linda Wheeler, um, even though deep down they knew that their marriage wouldn't last because he'd be leaving this earth soon. The wedding was scheduled for May 23rd, um, but had to be canceled because on May 23rd, Freddie ended up slipping into a coma. On June 6th at 10 a.m., Freddie kind of jerked out of bed and looked at Linda. And he said, Linda, get my boots. I'm ready. And it leaves me wondering, what did he see? Um, this is that moment where eternity seems to meet the present moment, where we'll all eventually experience this moment. And I believe Freddie was on to the next thing. He said, Linda, get my boots. On this earth, he really only would have needed one boot. But he said, get my boots. And I believe at the end of the day, he was healed. He was on to the next thing, and he had beaten cancer, even though it had taken him down on this earth. He passed away just over one year after the Notre Dame game. And it leaves me thinking about the lessons to be learned from this. Um, but how do we handle bad news? How do we handle when we get punched in the mouth? Do we move on to the next thing or do we get stuck in the first thing that happened to us? Do we smile through the adversity in the fight or do we just wave our hands at it and simply quit? I think how we handle adversity and how we handle the suck is what defines us. And it leaves me wondering, is the pain in the life often tied to our purpose in this life of how we handle the pain? Jocko Willink has a way of saying good. Jocko Willink will have this phrase of good if, if when, when things happen, when 
um, you find yourself in a dead marriage that's unraveling, well, good. Good. Gives you a chance to, to work on your marriage, improve it, and improve your relationship, and create a legacy with one another, and make each other better, and revive a dead marriage. Or, um, you know, you lose your temper on your kids or your spouse or your friend, and well, good. Gives you a chance to address what's really going on emotionally and why you're, why you're popping off like that. Or, you know, you end up in a ditch, drinking too much, whatever it is, well, good. Gives you a chance to maybe get sober, change your life, change your legacy, change the future generations for it. Um, or when the call comes in that you didn't expect or the diagnosis you get or the impossible seems to happen, how do you handle it? Do we move on to the next thing or do we get stuck at the first thing that happened to us? You know, do you stand up or you fall to your knees and, and pout or what do we, how do we do? Do we swim in the self-pity? Um, or do we get back at it and just chase the impossible and move on to the next thing? So that's what I would say is get your boots back on and let's go on to the next thing. <laughs>